Um, but I thought we could just um, start off by hearing a bit more, for those who haven't heard before, the story of Mazimas. Right. So uh, Mazimas means with us in Greek, and the origin is the person who founded Mazimas. Uh, she's an American with Greek heritage, and she used to go to Greece. She, she had a, um, what do you call her? Not a grandmother, a godmother was a Greek lady who came to the U.S. when she was a baby, and she was brought up by her. And she saw this lady having a dream to be a baker, and she cooked lovely cakes and biscuits, and always said, oh, I would love to do this as a job. Uh, but only told her from her husband that, no, women should look after family and not have business. So she grew up with this feeling of injustice against women, and especially being an immigrant in, a, in New York, and she had a community, she could do the job, and she was just not allowed by the culture and the male culture of her culture, sorry. So she grew up and um, she understood more and more, and she studied as well uh, development and uh, gender studies, and she realized that she saw all over the world the same story of women being not able to do what they want to do by different cultures, especially when they're immigrants and come to a country they don't belong to and they feel they have no space for them to, to be independent to do what they want. So through food, and we know all of us and most of us have the same story of food is a place where women dominate and um, have total knowledge and uh, skills. And this is a very easy uh, way for you to belong and to be part of society through food and cooking. So we said, what about bringing these immigrant women who live all over the world, and in London as an example, who had so many skills at home but feel they don't have a space to belong to their former society or to work. So Mazi Mas is about giving women this opportunity to work uh, with something they have tremendous skills, and they sometimes you know, even feel valued for the skills, so we show them that they only need opportunity to have this skill. So we, belong, we believe women don't need help, they need just opportunity. To 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 put to have these skills shown and uh, find jobs and give them so we create a collaboration between bringing their skills and the knowledge with uh, adapting to a London or a big city palette for the people. So all these women work together from from different countries. Like we have Nasrin from Iran, we have Lusmila from Ecuador, and uh, we had already many women before from Ethiopia, India, Sri Lanka, you name it. And uh, it's always been a success. And uh, another idea, so the ladies who are with us, they got jobs. Because the moment they come in and they feel valued and realize the skills they have, and they are confident, they also want to do it. So they go out there and they find jobs. And they are, all of them, uh, all the women who would not even speak English well. So it transforms their lives and their children. So it becomes role models, the communities as well. So it's a ripple effect. Um, at the moment, so we started very small, and then we had lots of support, and we did lots of different events for places like we are here. And then we had residency inside uh, nice theatres in London for a long time. And now we have a store in uh, Old Spitalfield Market. They have a new area, and we have a store. We are there every day of the week, so if you would like to come and say hello and eat lovely food like the one you had here. And the money, the company is a social enterprise, so all the money goes back to the company, and it's only about giving other women the opportunity to do this uh, transition between being just a, a mother at home, feeling that she can be part of society and work and be independent. So um, we have a website as well, mazimas.co.uk, where it's M-A-Z-I, space M-A-S, oh, on the website together. And you can see all the story and what we do. We cater for events as well. And um, we, our dream is to have a proper restaurant very soon. And uh, all over the world, the same, like restaurants, because we know the problem is uh, endemic, and we have it all over the world, women who would love to belong and be, to make society a, a happier, more loving place for all of us, all of us. Amazing. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited that the stall is underway and um, I'm looking forward for all of the plans and the different mini enterprises that are emerging out of these initial spaces for training and learning and sharing. Um, and that's something that's always struck me as very powerful about 
um, the Mazimas project is the spaces that you create for different people who have different relationships to food and to ingredients to create this other space, this new space to, you know, to build on these original recipes. Um, but first I thought we could maybe each talk about um, your individual relationships to rice. <laughs> I guess we all, all of us, we've we've had the mini chats about it. But what are you, what is your history or relationship to rice? Well, mine starts from a very basic level. As uh, brought up in England by a Scots mother, rice in our house was, I'm ashamed to say, Uncle Ben's. <laughs> And I married into a different culture. My husband, um, his family's from the Indian subcontinent. And the first time I tried to cook rice for him, he was so upset. <laughs> <laughs> and said, I need to teach you how to cook rice. <laughs> so I learned from uh, my husband, oddly enough, to begin with. And um, from there, I have learned so much from working with so many different people. I'd already achieved a higher level by the time I moved to working with, with Mazimas. Um, but um, I loved the way that on the subcontinent uh, that rice had so many different ways of, of being cooked um, and up to the sort of the pinnacle for them for, for the biryanis, for the sort of dumb method for doing all of that and then discovered that this comes from somewhere else and they had learned this centuries ago from a different culture and then I've been lucky enough now to work with people from that culture too and learn more myself. So that's my brief potted history of rice. <laughs> I'm going to move to you now, Stream. Um... Uh, rice for us as Iranian is a part of the every day uh, you wake up with the smell of rice, not just for breakfast, not for breakfast, but you know, my mom used to make the lunch very early. So each time it was going to school, the smell of the rice and tea, Persian tea was just everywhere in the house. So that was a wake up er er every morning. So, and uh, just. Um, very different from the uh, as what I've seen in Mazimaz, very different from the other countries, the way they're cooking the rice. I find it very uh, special way Iranian they're cooking uh, compared to the other culture. Uh, for example, the, uh, the way in the Far East they're cooking rice is just being Iranian kitchen is shameful rice. But my kids, they love that. They love to go to Chinese and they have the sticky rice. But if in Iranian kitchen, you make the sticky uh, rice. That could be that shows you don't have a skill to cook yeah. the rice properly. But it's different. And uh, I have to say, I have to learn the sticky rice because I tried very you know, so many times to make it as sticky as, stick as the way they're cooking. It didn't come. It was still individual. And my son said, Mom, that's not Chinese. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a challenge for me as well. So let's go to Brazil and see what was there. Well, I'm from Brazil and uh, we live on rice and rice is everything. Um, we eat every day, everywhere. It's rice and beans, rice and beans. And we even use it as a kind of saying, oh, it's like rice and beans, so it's absolutely common. Um, but there is a skill, even if it's just plain rice, you need to uh, fry it first, onions and garlic. And then you put the rice and you mix it, and then you put the water. And there's lots of different ways and ideas how to do the proper rice. You put the water in, you put the water, a lot of water, a little water, how long, and it's all like a, a lot of knowledge from different people. Um, I, I mean, my, the first thing I've cooked when I was a child was rice. I never forget that scene of me saying, I'm going to cook for my friends, I have a restaurant. And I went to the backyard in my countryside house, we had a small house, and I cooked rice and potatoes. And I said, this is my rice. And I called the neighbors and everyone ate. But I never forgot. So rice is such an important part of our culture. Um, and I think that I, um, it's, um, it's very important. I was going to say after about the politics of rice. Um, in an incredible, big, huge country like Brazil that we eat rice, um, we know, or probably you all know, that the rice companies, the companies that control the commodity, are very few ones and the price and the control they have on the price and uh, all these questions. And I was very happy to, by coincidence, reading a book yesterday, a new um, uh, OGM in Brazil who talks about the, the politics of agriculture business. 
and they were saying there's a lot of new, new there's associations in the world. There's especially one who has 10 million farmers who farm rice from 50 countries that they pay 50% more for the price. So there is a lot of fight for the rice that we can eat rice. So maybe as we do with coffee, we should question where the people who eat so much rice, who are the people planting this rice, how much money they get. Because more and more, unfortunately, all these commodities we have are controlled by very few people. And we are totally in their hands to, to the prices and the power they have over us. So I was very glad to know that the rice are going back to sea as well, uh, renaissance, or um, that people are back to have control the small farmers. So it was a great, something that gave me hope. <laughs> so now it's very near to me in the South America. Um, <laughs> in my country, it's the same. Uh, every time I, we cook in the rice, rice with um, achiote, uh, with beans, and with chicken, Every day we cook in the, the rice. It's the principal meat. Um, I, uh, I was really excited to hear about um, Ecuadorian fried rice. Because the fried rice dish. Chaulafan. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Chala you know tell me about, no, Chala I just Fan. heard about it because of you, but um, yeah, tell me about it because uh, it is like fried rice. It's like uh, ch the Chinese fried rice. The is the... Um, um, chicken, pork, and beef, and prawns, and legs, eggs, and soja sauce. Soja sauce. Yeah, is every time Friday, and the rice is is okay. Mm -hmm. It's the famous. So <laughs> it's, it's like famous. so. Chalafan yeah, yeah, yeah. is like Chinese fried rice. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. And it, and it but it's in my country, it's Ecuadorian. It's famous. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, ex I'm happy you brought up some of these, the politics of rice, because if we think about histories of empire, um, we've had many sessions in the last few weeks where we've had, we've literally had a map of importations uh, for the British Empire, exactly like the percentages of each of the colonies and what they're providing in terms of food. But rice is used very much as a political weapon as well in spaces where it's like the staple. There have been many protests, there were famous rice shortages um, historically, like in the last hundred years that are well documented. Um, but I thought we could talk, especially since we've eaten so much Iranian rice, maybe to talk about the contemporary politics of rice in Iran. And I know that there is a shortage at the moment, Cont like right now. Could you share a bit about that? Um, rice is not staple food for Iranian since, I could say, beginning of the 20th century. Mostly was the bread, but... Um, but beginning of the 20th century, middle of it, it's just uh, every day, a couple of times a day. And it strangely grows different parts of Iran. I always, I grew up near the Caspian Sea. I thought it's the only place they grow the rice is near the Caspian Sea. But I look at the, uh, some in information in the internet and I see that we got in Esfahan, which is the middle of Iran, and it's a very uh, dry climate, hot climate, but uh, some part of it, Still, they grow the rice, and some place near the um, Afghanistan border, Baluchistan, they growing rice as well. So, um, but um, is not still under the government control. So, it's the small farmers. But recently, I gathered the information. Government starting to because there is a unfortunately because of the climate situation, the hot weather and the, all the water is just disappearing because of the wrong uh, decision they are making. The farmers and the government doesn't have a control over that. Um, strangely, that uh, situation is just really bad and bad. But government trying to gain the control. And, uh, but in not really right way. Some people, they're buying the lands and they start to farming the rice. Uh, and um, we have the issue importing it, especially with now the sanction. So many uh, items, everyday items, is 
very difficult to gain uh, control and find it. You know, I was in Iran for summer and my father is suffering with the heart disease. I have to take buy a medicine from here and take it to him. You know, something like a medicine very essential for him. They could not find it because of the sanction. And the rice is like that. I've been in a bazaar um, in uh, Azerbaijan and I find it very difficult for people because of the price. And but not being able to uh, import it is going to be even worse. The price has gone up really very much. So it's very difficult for people something like rice, which it was simple, basic uh, food for the people with the low income. Now it's going to be very expensive and it's going to be even harder to uh, find it because they cannot import it. So we're having an issue. Climate change is a part of it, and the, uh, the sanction is another one. So, and the price is going up. So yeah, we're having a big issue there. I wanted to um, move back into the Mazimas kitchen yep. um, because the, what you're doing as an enterprise, as a business, um, is, a, I think, a really major intervention in the food industry. And I wanted to kind of take these conversations we're having about food politics um, into the politics of the food industry um, and the different power dynamics there and the way that Mazimas might be intervening in that. I, I think as well a lot about the idea of food and who defines what cuisine is and who is cooking the cuisine and deciding what it is. Um, and also the removal sometimes in the food industry of um, like the histories or maybe these like quite violent histories that come with um, the reason why we're all eating this food. Um, I don't know, we had some really interesting conversations, but maybe we could start with the creation of Mazimas recipes and the way that all of these different um, people with different histories and different food cultures come together and maybe you could describe a little bit what that's like, how a recipe comes together maybe. Um, so uh, it's a, a diverse group of people who come together and it, it's, I think it starts from a place of great generosity actually. People come prepared to share what they know, what they've grown up with, uh, what they understand. We don't always speak the same language as each other in the kitchen so people always think that may be a big barrier but somehow there's something about coming together in a kitchen that we have a shared language already, so we kind of understand something about what we're doing together. Um, and we start by um, talking about food and cultures and where we come from and what's valuable to us and what we like. And then from there, um, the various chefs come in and show different things that they've done, and we, um, people like me doing the training side of it, and documenting that we learn so much about the food, about where it came from, about the history, about what's important for it. And we have to somehow translate it into um, a con the new context that we're in, in a sort of uh, a London-based context. So I don't know. It's a very dynamic experience, I think, isn't it, what we do in the kitchen? It's very hard to explain exactly how it all comes together. But we're usually just full of ideas and excitement. And it's like, oh, my God, we could do this. Or we could try that. Or I hadn't thought about this going with that. And so it becomes its own thing in the end um, with, its, with very much rooted in somebody's culture or somebody's history or somebody's story. So I think that's... Does that get us started on how that works? <laughs> I, can, I can say something very important about that. Um, the main difference everyone says about our kitchen, even when we are in a kind of restaurant setting, is how calm it is, how peaceful, because everyone has this horrible image about kitchens being this um, aggressive and fast and uh, horrible places. But that's because the, if you realize there's only men on them, in them. So that's a big difference because I worked in a kitchen with, uh, in a male kitchen. And the sexism in the food industry is absolutely horrendous. I had to give up the job because I was absolutely, every time I come out of the place, I felt so down, not only tired. 
humiliated because they treated me as almost like I had no skills. They are the men, they are the ones doing, they give me like to chop potatoes. Or they would never ask me if I have any knowledge of food, of interest. I totally become someone under them without even speaking to, f apart from all the things I had to hear from them and the treatment. So I just came out one day feeling so horrible. And I just had a little uh, something lightning in my head and said, oh, I can just leave the job. And I was totally transformed. And I said, I'm not going back. And what's the freedom? Even without the money, I said, I can't work for that money. So we want to question as well um, the, the hypocrisy of the, the food world that takes all these recipes. If you ask any big chef, they will say, oh, this is from my grandmother. Oh, I have an aunt and my mom. And honor all these women. But where are they? Why are they not working? Why did they own the business? So they are just remembered as a fiction, fiction of a, a figure that you think is lovely and kind, using the, the typical image of women. But these women want to be part of the business. They want to run the business. They want to earn the money from the business, from the knowledge that they have. So that's what we do. We want the women. And to show as well a very important point I want to say to everyone. We are not a charity. Women don't need charity. because We don't want people to think they want to buy our food because they're doing us a favor. No, we want to compete because we know the food. We do it well. We do it better than because we do it with care. And this is seen by every day working in a, in a restaurant when we work with other people. We can see even our chefs would say to proper chefs, as they say they are, uh, they, they get an ingredient that they don't know and we know and they do it in a not a right way like a barber is from Iran we saw like really good chefs from uh, Michelin stars they just get the barbers and quick put it on and said no 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 you need to wash them and take there's a kind of a sand inside so you need to put in some warm water oh no it doesn't matter wow it does matter but they don't know and they don't ask anyone but they think they know so all these little things and the care that we bring to do uh, people are more loyal as well because they, they are cooking food that they really love and care for. So we think, and we heard from people that you can taste it, the kind of more depth of flavor and because we, we spend hours cooking. It's not just something you do quick. So there's so much more to food and I think we are in a, in a, in a stage now more mature and understanding that people want as well the meaning of food. We want to know that the food we eat has something behind or someone behind. Where does it come from? Where does it go to? And who are these people cooking? So I wish that uh, the food industry has a huge uh, number of vacancies now. They're desperate for chefs. And we have all this, what I call the invisible army of wonderful women and cooks everywhere that they just don't have jobs and they're stuck in houses and feeling not well and not participating in their children, their communities. So we want to make this, we have these wonderful uh, employees to all business people to run the business, so why are we not bringing these people in the business? So that's our question, and we want to make this changing in the food industry to, to get opportunities to be a better place and a better food for everyone.